فورڈ ہے السلام علیکم آئی ایم ڈاکٹر باجوا آرتھوپیڈک سرجن ہیئر ایٹ فاطمہ میموریل ہاسپٹل آئی ایم گریجویٹ فرام علامہ اقبال میڈیکل کالج ان نائنٹین ایٹی فور اینڈ آئی ورک فار تھرٹین ایئرز ان یو کے کم بیک ہیئر ٹو اسٹارٹ دا ڈپارٹمنٹ آف آرتھوپیڈکس ہیئر آف کورس دیٹ ول میک می ہیڈ آف دا ڈپارٹمنٹ بیکاز آئی ایم دی اونلی سینئر پرسن ڈوئنگ آرتھوپیڈکس ہیئر آئی ہیو پرسنل انٹرسٹ ان لم ریکنسٹرکشن ایز ویل ایز جوائنٹ ریپلیسمنٹ مور ریسنٹلی ان مائی لاسٹ فائیو ایئرز ان یو کے آئی ہیو بین ڈوئنگ آتھراسکوپیز آف دا شولڈر اینڈ نی بوتھ تھراپیوٹک اینڈ ڈائگنوسٹک وچ آئی ہیونٹ یٹ گوٹ اے چانس ٹو ڈو ہیئر اسپیشلی دا شولڈر آتھراسکوپی آل دو آئی ریگولرلی ڈو نی آتھراسکوپیز فار تھراپیوٹک ریزنس ٹوڈے آئی ہیو بین آسٹ ٹو گیو یو اے بریف اباؤٹ orthopedics I do understand some of you are very experienced and some of you may be not especially in orthopedics I found it very difficult as to choose what I say in this uh, lecture hopefully everything is alright I've got two topics to go through. Very shortly, I'll go through the topic of radiology. I have a few personal concerns about the utility of x-rays in our country. And you have a major role to play in requesting x-rays and maybe interpreting them as well. So the second part of my talk would be about my own subject, mainly trauma as to management of fractures and I'll in the end I'll go through some examples which may uh, look familiar to you I'll be very pleased to answer any questions at the time when we do the examples we can discuss and go through them if there are any management issues of course I'll be presenting my point of view I understand uh, Professor Safdar is going to talk a little bit about radiology or a lot about radiology, so I won't talk too much about it. In the last one month here at uh, Fatma Memorial Hospital, there were 63 x-rays of the spine which were done in our department. Most of these spinal x-rays, including cervical, thoracic and lumbar spine, do come to me and I, I look at them. I can only honestly say that around about 30% of them did not need an x-ray, but they were just done. Because, not because the lay person suggested that I have an x-ray, the doctors actually themselves requested, let's do an x-ray and see what it is, uh, rather than going through a thorough clinical examination. Uh, that's where I would uh, provoke thought in your mind as GPs as to requesting x-rays. There are a few points I want to raise. At average, there are 2,300 x-rays which are done here at Fatima Warren Hospital. This is the figure I got from their radio, radiographer. He's not quite sure about the strength of the uh, ionizing radiation but that's the milliampere power which which they give and uh, I have I haven't found any figures to quote as to the seriousness of the number of x-rays especially the KUB axis or lumbar spine axis I, I do know that the lumbar spine axis are most uh, penetrating and most damaging for the organs because they get a high, very high dose on it That's where I want you to think about and we as well, as well as our radiographer, as well as a management, there's a, there's a safety issue for the clinicians, for the patients and the scatter issue from the x-ray machine. This all I think needs to be standardized as it is in the West. Uh, in the West if somebody is going to have a chest x-ray they will have a lead apron on their groin. If somebody is going to have a abdominal x-ray they will have a thyroid uh, covering shield the radiographer will himself have a double shield there won't be any people uh, uh, almost two meters around the x-ray there won't be any people the lead screen is regularly screened 
uh, checked for safety standards. So just a thought provoking. I'm not, uh, I, it's just, just my concern I want to mention about radiology. Lead gowns, the gloves, the thyroid screen, other screens. Because when we do request an X-ray, these are the things you need to keep in mind. Please ask yourself, and I do ask myself, so I would request you to do the same. I uh, take you as my colleagues. The importance of requesting an X-ray is our responsibility. Is the X-ray essential? We can justify almost all X-rays we do, and it's only when you have a critical appraisal of your practice that you can say what percentage of your X-rays were absolutely essential and what you could have avoided by doing another examination. Will it change my management? Uh, I do ask this question all the time uh, because um, I, I fear that the x-ray is a dangerous modality. It should not be repeated. They have lost the x-rays and okay, let's do another one. Is it going to change my management? Will it affect if I ask them to go and find the old one rather than me asking you to do another one? It will, it's a shortcut. So if it's not going to change my management drastically, I'll wait for them to either find the old one or not do it at all. Will it add to my information, the information which I get from history, the clinical examination, from other specialties, when the patient is presenting to you? Will, do I still need more investigation? Probably the same with all the blood investigations we do, uh, but this is, these are the questions we need to ask. Have I done a thorough history and done a clinical examination? Is the request appropriate? That is where I think uh, we need to liaise a lot with you people when you are requesting an x-ray, that x-ray may not be appropriate for for me, for, for example. Uh, if there's a knee x-ray which is done supine, is totally useless for me, I would want a weight-bearing knee x-ray. So if you're doing, for example, an x-ray on a knee with a person with pain in his knee, uh, is, is, isn't it best to be able to discuss with your colleague, well, I'm going to be asking you to look after this patient after I've seen him. What views do you want? There are certain views for scaphoid, certain views for cervical spine. There are specialist views for quite a few of the bony structures. It's best to discuss them rather than doing them twice. Oh, no, this x-ray is not good. The exposure is not good enough. Maybe we want a digital x-ray. So is the request appropriate? Have you discussed it with your colleague? These are general indications which all of us would agree may need an x-ray. It's uh, only for academic purpose, really. You probably all know that you will do an x-ray for, for a trauma. You will do an x-ray if there's a tumor. If you're doing a skeletal survey, you want to do the long bone x-rays apart from the bone scan. But these are the x-rays which we end up doing. For example, for congenital anomalies, uh, you, you may have a child with, give me an example, a child with foot pain and uh, uh, walking with a limp. You say, okay, go and have an x-ray. I want an oblique x-ray to see uh, synostosis somewhere. But that oblique x-ray won't be done the first time. So the child will have two x-rays. Maybe he'll have a third x-ray. I'll still say, no, it's not right. Let's do another x-ray. Just to reduce them. The indications are there. It's only a matter of discussion or maybe good contact with your specialist colleagues. A limb deformity, we'll all do an X-ray for a limb deformity. But again, I want a joint above and below of a limb deformity. If I want to manage a limb deformity, I need to see the alignment of the joint above and below. If that is not done, just the deformity is done, it is uh, incomplete information and probably useless. Osteomyelitis, again. Osteomyelitis is a clinical diagnosis. You see if there's a osteomyelitis there, or there's a discharging sinus, there's redness, there's pain, there's history. There are previous x-rays. There's no need to do a fresh x-ray. You want to do an x-ray of osteomyelitis when you want to manage it. So the best uh, way to go about doing x-rays is, is to let the person who's going to manage it to do it. Or if you're going to share the management, then discuss with them. Okay, this is the patient. What x-ray do you need? these metabolic diseases, you need x-rays, but there are screening x-rays for hyperparathyroidism. You may not do all of them. It's best to discuss. Arthritis, I put it last because I don't agree that all arthritis should be x-rays. Uh, an elderly lady with a knee pain in your clinic, you know she's got arthritis. The x-ray is not going to change the management. It's just going to expose her to radiation. Uh, if, if somebody wants to manage the arthritis, they want to do a joint replacement, they want a full uh, weight-bearing x-ray, they want uh, uh, skyline views of the patella, and then they want to plan the surgery. Okay, justifying the exposure. X-ray 
is not to replace a thorough clinical examination. It's again the same story. You need to do a thorough clinical examination. 50% of your X-rays will go down the drain. X-ray requests will go in the bin. I, I do the same. So, uh, lumbar sacral spine for low back pain. I can't justify an X-ray of the lumbar sacral spine for simple low back pain. If I have done a thorough clinical examination, I still suspect a, a lesion in the bone, then I want to do it. For a simple sciatica, which is not going to show, a disc is not going to show up on the x-ray. There's no point doing a lumbar sacral spine x-ray. And this is one x-ray this which exposes us to radiation the most. Chest x-ray, auscultate the chest. If there's nothing on the auscultation, why you want to do a chest x-ray? This is where I disagree with the knee stress, asking for an x-ray of chest for everyone because they haven't auscultated the chest. They need to, uh, clinically, in, a, in a UK it's a routine practice, nobody ever has an x-ray of the chest uh, under 40. If there are findings in somebody above 40, you discuss it with the knee stress whether they still need an x-ray and then we request a chest x-ray. Uh, I, I would be happy to answer your questions in the end, but I would say if, if you are suspecting on clinical grounds there is consolidation, you want to see how much consolidation is there. You want to see whether it is progressive or not. So that's why you do an x-ray if there are clinical findings. Not that the clinical finding stops you from doing an x-ray, it of course guides you to doing the x-ray rightfully. A dislocated joint, I forgot to, show, uh, to say something on that. A dislocated joint is a standard practice never x-rayed in the West. We never x-ray a dislocated joint. As soon as we x-ray a dislocated joint, there's a call out for uh, explanation because a dislocated joint should be reduced, never x-rayed. Any joint will suspect osteoarthritis as I mentioned. <coughs> skull x-rays for head injury, what, what difference is it going to make if somebody has got a head injury and you do a skull x-ray unless you do a CT for a hematoma. If there is of course a clinical uh, depressed fracture and there is a wound there, then you want to do it. That's where the clinical examination comes. A routine skull x-ray for somebody with a concussion or a head injury is I, I would say is a waste. That's an x-ray of a dislocated hip. That should not be x-rayed. That should be reduced first. Sorry. That should be reduced first before you do an x-ray. It, it, it is a negligence if you do an X-ray of a dislocated joint. Is the X-ray appropriate? Now, this is one problem which I face here uh, because um, in the West they have actually labels on the X-ray as to the name of the patient, the uh, identity number, their date, age, sex, and the uh, time of the X-ray, which is not here. So you need to match the identity. You may be looking at somebody else's X-ray. I have come across that problem, so I mentioned that. The exposure quality, big problem. You want a digital X-ray for everyone. Exposure quality of normal routine X-rays doesn't tell you the trabecular pattern, doesn't show you a uh, undisplaced fracture sometimes, doesn't show you a stress fracture, doesn't show you a pathological fracture. So you need a digital exposure X-ray. So the exposure quality either it should be very good or we need to have a better quality imaging. <coughs> Is the X-ray going to be informative? Does it include the joint above and below? As I mentioned earlier, I need to see the joints above and below. So the x-ray, is it a full informative x-ray? Two views, you need to have two views because we all have two limbs. If there is a um, pediatric injury to the elbow on one side, I do a comparative view if I'm not sure whether it is the evolution of the epicondyle or is it the epiphysis, just the epiphysis which is like that and the child has pain in that area. So growing ends of the bone, do the comparative use. And that's the last bit I've alluded to a few times. You need functional state of, uh, especially in orthopedics, you need a functional state. You need a, a full inspirative view in the chest. You need a weight bearing view of the knee. You need a, a standing uh, lateral or AP in scoliosis. That's the last slide of me being a radiologist. I'll stop being a radiologist after this. But this is a, a good lesson to go through. When you're looking at an x-ray, the eyes will never see what you don't, don't know, uh, which uh, I teach them to the final year students all the time, but we forget it. So I teach myself a lot of times. You need a viewing box. You need to look at it twice. This is where uh, actually arrogance comes. You need to look at the x-ray twice, even if your patient is sitting. Say you may have missed something. Even if you haven't missed something, it's a good practice to look at it twice.
Remember the soft tissues. When we are looking at the X-rays, we only concentrate on the bone. Bone is only one part of the X-ray. It's mainly a soft tissue injury which happens to have a fracture in the middle. If you have that concept, you will look at the soft tissue. You share the X-ray with a colleague. If you look at it twice, you have it looked by two people. That's another good clue to not missing a lesion, a fracture, a tumor. You relate it to your clinical finding. We have a great difficulty in our X-ray requests which go to the X-ray department. There's no clinical description. The radio, radio, radiographer, radiologist, the chap who looks at the X-rays needs to have some X information about the clinical condition of the patient. Only then he can really comment. One way to look at the X-ray is to divide it into a few parts like we do on the lung X-ray into zones. I do the same in uh, limb X-rays. I divide it into three or four parts. The metaphyseal, the diaphyseal, the epiphyseal and the joint. And then look at them all one at a time. Just to avoid missing out things. Comparative X-rays, I've already mentioned uh, is in uh, children. Not all normal looking X-rays are normal. A compression, compression fracture of the vertebra will not show on an X-ray. It's a pathological fracture. A scaphoid fracture will not show on an X-ray unless you do an MRI. It will show edema in the fracture line. That is going to be a fracture. Or you do an X-ray a week later. So not all normal looking X-rays are normal. Relate them to the clinical finding. Or do the X-ray twice. Do it again. Ask somebody else to look at it. Or yourself look at it twice. That's the second part of my uh, talk, which is about trauma. And if you want to ask me any questions about the, what I've said about radiology, I'll be happy to answer them now. Uh, we don't get the diagnosis from the radiologist. Why from here we do his team? It can be required from the radiologist. And the radiologist mentioned that certain types of regions are formed, but uh, no clear diagnosis. Yes. If, because you are having uh, experience of seeing so much x-rays, you, you, you can uh, at least uh, mention your diagnosis so that we can formulate later on with our uh, clinical and uh, lab diagnosis. Thank you very much. That's a good question. First of all, I must say I'm not a radiologist, so I don't read X's. I'm an orthopedic surgeon. Secondly, the radiologists in our uh, hospital have requested a lot of times that he needs a full clinical history before he can comment on it. And thirdly, this is uh, now a trend coming up. To be on the safe side, you give a broad uh, result out on an X-ray. That it could be this, it could be that, it could be that. That's where the point of discussion comes. You ring up your radio radiologist or radiographer and ask him, well, this is what I am suspecting. What do you think? Just look at it again. Maybe come and look at it with me. That's the matter of time. But that's quality care. You take the X-ray to the radiographer and discuss with him there and then. You get the diagnosis. Ask for the second stage of investigation. That's what we do in the West. We, we, we don't stop looking after that patient unless you've reached a conclusion. Thank you. You do an, an extra x-ray, like the Americans do a CT scan for anybody who comes in casualty with energy and don't even look at the patient. But that's not the clinician's practice. That is a wrong practice. You don't do x-rays just because there's somebody is going to sue you later. You do an X-ray if it is clinically indicated. Now some people do medical legal practice. Of course it's justified. They have to do lots of views to, to cover their medical legal issues. But not as a, no, a, a general clinician who has got no responsibility as to where the bullet has gone or how it has gone. They, they want to treat the patient's symptoms and uh, make the patient better. Not get them uh, a big claim into their pocket. And the second part of your question was, uh, uh, yeah, some of the patients, of course, if you ask me, uh, I'll simply say, say straight, no, I don't do x-rays because you are asking it. It doesn't matter. And the other practice which I, I actually would, would like to insist on, of course, people have their own way, is to never look at the x-ray. First look at the patient. Never uh, agree to look at an x-ray. Say, I want to look at the patient. That's where you'll be a clinician. 
Otherwise, you'll be a radiographer. So patients come with x-rays, lots of them, can you see this x-ray, what shall we do? I don't treat x-rays, I don't look at x-rays, you look at patients, you decide. So the patient is asking you, I think it is wrong practice to do an x-ray on request. That's why we want prescription on medicine, we want x-rays on clinicians' advice, we want blood tests on clinician advice, not walking off the street and having hepatitis uh, uh, screening done on your, on your own. It has to be a clinician involved. have a lots of tricks up their sleeve. They do mammograms. This is a soft tissue x-ray, right? And they do a very good mammograms. You can see lots of things, even scarring when they're doing a mammogram. So it is a possible, it's a possible possibility that you can look at soft tissues on a good x-ray. I find here digital x-rays are better. You can see the soft tissues better on them. But if you want to look at a soft tissue, like if you're asking for a shoulder x-ray, uh, an x-ray of the shoulder looking at soft tissue, why you want to do an X-ray of for soft tissue, ask for an ultrasound or an MRI scan. Maybe you're asking the wrong investigations. But if you still expect them to show a comment on the soft tissue like on a big tumor on the femur and there is soft tissue around it and they haven't commented, that's where you discuss with them, really. But the soft tissue are important from the management point of view. When I say tumors, for example, whether the tumor is still intracompartmental or extracompartmental, the only way you can tell is if there is soft tissue extension from the bone. Then that's where the management issues come. I would suggest that if you want a soft tissue X-ray, ask for a soft tissue investigation, which is MRI. Thank you. This is one uh, message which I would like you to take home. One of the messages which I would like you to take home. You can forget everything else. Then remember the bone is attached to a patient, which we forget lots of time. Uh, people start examining the injured limb without realizing how much the patient is in pain, how, whether the patient is in diabetic coma. They only look at the limb. So remember, the patient is at the other end of the bone. Take a full history whenever you can. This is what I teach to my medical students all the time. Before you make any conclusions on any aspect of your clinical diagnosis, you take a full history. You take the negative history as well. At, at the, of course, the undergraduate level, we take negative history, like no history of this, no history of that. But at your level, of course, you want to take a full history, a relevant history as to the somebody with a trauma. The history of epilepsy, history of diabetes, maybe he's gone, uh, got a coma, uh, hypoglycemic attack, he had an injury, he's epileptic, he had an injury. Just a relevant history. <clears throat> Next is we look for signs of shock and hemorrhage. Uh, any presentation of uh, trauma, for example, in your clinic, you would like to go through the ABC, the airway, the breathing and circulation. You won't uh, realize how many times we miss out on ABC and just straight away start managing the limb injury. Just if you remember it, then you will never forget it. Other injuries? There could be an injury of the spine in somebody with a calcaneal fracture. We are managing the calcaneal fracture or the foot injury and never look at the spine. It's an axial force, can damage the, uh, uh, the spine and have a uh, displaced fracture of the spine. Look for other injuries. Predisposing cause, I've alluded to like epilepsy or this diabetes. The patient has other, is taking drugs. Trauma, open injury. 
open fracture is a soft tissue injury complicated by a break I said it earlier but that's another the second lesson which I would like everyone to remember that a soft tissue injury which is complicated by a break it's not the break which is which is important it's the soft tissue injury because if the limb is going to survive it needs to be well vascularized not develop a compartment syndrome not develop infection not develop gangrene these are all soft tissue problems the bone is going to heal in the end open fracture is a surgical emergency you see somebody in the clinic with that you need to be alerted that this person or patient is needed to be managed before anyone else 30 percent open injuries are poorly traumatized so this is not a single injury look thoroughly at the rest of the patients around the patient 15 percent will have life-threatening injuries it's a quite a percentage of an open tibial fracture for example in your clinic that 15 percent may have an atlanto axial injury which you haven't realized you have you haven't immobilized the neck because you haven't thought of the other injuries the primary aim in an open fracture is to prevent infection probably you all know about it you probably start treating them straight away with antibiotics but these are just the steps we, we do for any injury now clinical examination uh, if, if you find it is too simple then still let me go through it uh, if you have forgotten it will be useful for you any injury three steps to remember this again one lesson if you take home I'll be very happy you look you feel and move you don't move before you look and you don't feel before you look you do stepwise on any limb injury you first look and then again you look and look again you don't look once and make up your mind you look once and then come back again and look at it again and that's how we do our history we leave gaps in our history gaps in our examination we do a little bit of examination and then maybe come back again and do another exam you'll find something else so look and look again right and right again exposure is extremely important somebody with an injury at the front of the knee if you haven't looked at the popliteal fossa there may be a big gash at the back which is missed until the patient went to theater or until somebody looked around the limb so exposure is extremely important it's part of the a b c d e look around the limb look for any bleeding swelling discoloration deformity bleeding is apparent swelling is very important because is it increasing progressive pulsatile is there any change in the color of the limb distal to it is the deformity there which is a fracture underneath I'm only alluding to this thing just for the sake of compartment syndrome which is a known complication the open fracture is as much likely to develop compartment syndrome as is the closed fracture because the facial compartments are still there people do have a misconception that the open fracture is bleeding outside you won't have a compartment syndrome it's as likely to have it because the muscle swelling is still in the facial compartments friction burns clinic examination look feel and move you've done the look bit that's the feel bit you look feel for the pulse distally you see the local temperature and tenderness why why I'm saying this all step why this needs to be documented when the patient is referred for example ultimately to a to a center for management there is no indication whether the pulse was looked at at the time of the first examination by the doctor because now the pulse is absent we don't know whether it was absent then so we don't know the time of ischemia we don't know whether the limb moved on the way and pressed on the vessel and the pulse is gone or whether the limb was cold there or it is cold now so a transfer of information of a systematic examination is very informative for the physician or the surgeon who's going to manage the, the patient ultimately third step is to move it what we look in the move can the patient move the joint distally so of course it confirms that the nerves are okay the muscles are okay the bone is in continuity so you can move move the joints distally the, if, even if the bone is not in continuity the tendons and the nerves if they are functioning the bone is not in continuity they can still move the joint distally this is quite reassuring if they can move the toes with an open fracture of the femur no sciatic nerve injury okay that's fine abnormal movements fracture will, hash, uh, will be abnormal movements crepitus will be there and uh, this is important degloved skin 
road traffic accident and if you get dragged on the on the road and you have a friction burn there, there could be a large area of the skin which has uh, been separated from the deep fascia the skin gets this blood supply from the deep fascia so the skin overlying the deep fascia slides like anything if it is degloved and that is the skin which is non viable because there's no blood coming it may still look pink to you but it will see soon going to necrose if you know already that there is a degloved skin you alter your management accordingly you decide the skin cover or the, uh, the cover of the wound accordingly. If there's pain on passive stretch, that's a good point for compartment syndrome. That's one test which you should all do. Somebody with a limb injury anywhere, stretch the muscles compartment where the injury is. For the flexors, you do the dorsiflexion if there's a compartment syndrome of the forearm. For the foot, you dorsiflex the foot if there's a compartment syndrome in the calf. You plantar flex the foot if the compartment syndrome is in the dorsum of the tibia in the tibialis anterior. So you stretch the muscle, it will be pain, very, very painful. Now I go on to the principles of treatment for simple or closed fractures. I think this is quite easy, it's probably done a lot many times. Again, treat the patient and not the fracture. Just remember that there is a, fra there is a patient at the other end of the limb. Reduce the fracture, the first principle is to reduce it, second is to hold it, and the third is to move it. You need to do them all, if possible, simultaneously, so that you don't miss out on movement, you don't miss out on holding. You need to reduce it first, then you hold the reduction, third bit is that you mobilize it. Lots of ways to mobilize it. Exercise it without moving the limb, isometric exercises. You do physiological loading, encourage them to wait as soon as they can. This is one way to mobilize any fracture early. The traction is holding the fracture. The knee is free to move up and down. The ankle is free. So it's, it's one way to early mobilize. Soon as you have reduced it, you haven't delayed until the fracture heals. The movement has started at the same time as the fracture has been held. Principles of treatment and casualty. Just imagine that this casualty is your surgery uh, or your GP practice area or your minor dressing area. Somebody has come with an open fracture. What you do? You do the first step is macro debridement. Take the big stuff out, big lump of grass, stone, mud, anything which you can see. Take it out with your hand. Don't wait. Don't leave it there. The time is in essence. So just take it off as soon as you can. You have given them adequate analgesia. Start cleaning it. Cover the wound with an antiseptic soak. Get a big wad of cotton. Fill it up with a betadine or pyridine soak and just cover it once you have taken the big stuff. You have helped the patient already. You have reduced the likelihood of infection. Start the broad spectrum antibiotics. We routinely use benzyl, penicillin and gentamicin. But nowadays people do use third generation phallosporins. You need to cover both the aerobes and anaerobes. Important step, splint it, the fracture. Use anything, use a wooden bar or use a stick, wrap it around the limb. Soon as you do the splintage, the bleeding stops, the pain stops and muscle spasm stops. Muscle spasm stops, patient gets cooperative. Bleeding reduces, pain relieves, give tetanus prophylaxis. These are five, four good steps which you can do there and then in your clinic. I'm sure most of you are doing it. It's, it will be a pity to miss any of these. That's the immediate management. Probably somebody with an open injury has come to the hospital by six hours. If they haven't come by six hours when the needs a definitive management, then we still are struggling. That's where the surgical debridement starts. And we tend to do this surgical debridement in less than six hours. Should be done. And this surgical debridement means micro debridement. The stuff you can't see, the small bits of sand, dust, small pieces of cloth, part of the charcoal, road, wood, any of the small items which are hidden in the muscles, which the bone has taken with it as it came out. It has happened a few times that an open injury, the bone came out, took a plug of mud from the grass and went in. And there's a small hole on the skin. So it's an open, dirty wound. You need to micro debride it with a pulse lavage. We don't have this facility of a pulse lavage, but we make our own pulse lavage. What you can do is to actually get a big bag of saline, ask somebody to squeeze it hard, and you hold the jet and wash it. That is an ideal way to wash it, under pressure. 
convert the principle is to we are converting a compound or an open fracture to a closed fracture or a simple fracture. Simple fracture is easy to manage. You just need to reduce, hold and move it. But a compound fracture is a soft tissue injury which happens to have a fracture in the middle. By doing immediate soft tissue cover. Now it is a standard practice in the West that any open wound, open fracture of the tibia for example gets a flap covered by the plastic surgeon. We, I used to do it myself, we rotate the gastrocnemius or a soleus, cover the, muscle, cover the bone there and then with the rotational muscle flap within six hours and put the skin graft on it. So the wound is now closed, the fracture is now simple, so treat it simply as uh, you would treat any simple fracture. I think uh, your role does come in, the, in these last two slides as to help in the management of an open fracture. Fracture reduction. You might have reduced uh, quite a few of fractures, but uh, all minimally displaced fractures, of course, uh, can be managed with uh, close reduction. Undisplaced fractures don't need any reduction. You can uh, do it under uh, adequate analgesia. Most fractures in children do not need open reduction. All, almost 80% of them are amenable to good manipulation. But you need good relaxation. That's where the general anesthesia comes. But in, in children, you need an anesthesia to reduce a fracture. They won't let you touch it. When the surgery is contraindicated, you tend to do a closed reduction. Somebody who's got uh, uncontrolled diabetes and then a uh, fracture of the tibia, you will, of course, want to closely reduce it, not to plate it, because of the risk of infection and the risk of other complications, risk of anesthesia. So when the surgery is contraindicated. Method, simple method, is to reverse the forces of injury and correct one displacement at a time under anesthesia. You need anesthesia to relax the muscles to, because the deforming forces in any fracture are gravity and the muscle. So gravity is gone when the patient is supine, muscles are gone when the patient has anesthesia. So now the patient is relaxed, you reverse the forces. I'll give you an example. For, for example, it says a wrist uh, distal radial fracture, which is called a Coley's fracture, not all of them are Coley's anyway. If the distal radius is gone dorsally, of course you want to push it plantarly. If it is supinated, you want to pronate it when you are reducing. If it is proximally drawn, you want to do traction uh, to reduce it. If it is angulated, you want to undo that angulation. If we know the deformity, you just need to reverse it. And to be able to know the deformity, you need a proper x-ray. Fracture reduction. Open reduction, you're all familiar with it. What open reduction means is open reduction, first step in the open reduction internal fixation. When we plate it, there are certain definitive indications of open reduction. Uh, I'm afraid this probably you, you don't do. This has to be done in the hospital. <coughs> but when the closed reduction fails or is impossible, then you want to do a open reduction. Intra-articular or pathological fractures cannot be managed by closed reduction. You need absolute congruence in intra-articular fractures. Any fracture that is going through the joint has to be reduced and fixed internally unless there is a contraindication. A pathological fracture will not heal if you treat it conservatively, I mean reducing it closed and managing it with a plaster. Avulsion and inherently unstable fractures will again need a surgeon because they are, the muscle is pulling it off. You cannot keep it where it should be. Uh, an avulsion of the calcaneal tuberosity with the tendoaculus, uh, an avulsion of the tibial tuberosity with the quadriceps, an avulsion of the patellar pole, or avulsion of the coracoid, avulsion of the olecranon. Any of these which have got strong muscle attachment on them or the medial epicondyle, you, you can't hold it reduced. Even if you manage to reduce it, as soon as the anesthesia is gone, it will come off. It needs to be internally fixed. Fracture dislocation, again, an absolute indication of uh, internal fixation. Dislocation needs to be urgently reduced, and the fracture needs to be managed with it. Polytrauma, somebody with more than two bone fractures, again, uh, needs to be internally fixed. You can, it's difficult to manage two bones simultaneously closed, like femur and tibia at the same time. They both need to be fixed. When we hold the fracture, there's one principle we need, all need to remember, there's no rigid hole. Rigid hole is not required. Micro movement is good for fracture, heals better. Only the fracture needs to be held. Don't hold the whole patient. Don't hold the joint above, don't hold the joint below. Don't bind the patient to the bed, let the patient move. So it's only the fracture that needs to be held, not the whole patient, so that we can continue with the principle of move. 
Main aim is to alleviate the pain and maintain alignment until nature heals the soft tissue and consolidates the fracture. We never heal the fracture, the nature heals it. We only hold it until it's done its job. Ideally, the limb function is to continue during this management of the fracture. Limb function actually needs to be started from day one. One way which you can do is to put an external fixer and ask them to start walking on it. So the limb function, the gravity is a good uh, stimulus for bone healing. For example, in this fixator, which we put on for a tibia fracture, um, of course fibular fracture as well, the ankle is free, the knee is free, the patient can flex the knee fully, the patient can move the knee, ankle as well. This was an open injury, the wound is also visible to be managed. Good way to manage something keeping in mind the principles of holding and moving at the same time. There are a few other ways in which we can be clever enough to hold the fracture. There are various forms of immobilization. You are probably familiar with them. Skeletal traction, we pin through the bone, splintage, which uh, most, most of the quacks know very well. They put um, splint, splints of uh, wood around it and it's very well splinted. I, I, I mentioned in the open fracture management, uh, for example, at, at the stage when the patient is presenting to you, splintage is very, very important. It reduces the bleeding, it uh, reduces the pain and uh, it comforts the patient so much you can transfer them unless you splint it difficult to transfer plaster cast standard way to immobilize a fracture functional bracing modern way to immobilize a fracture we don't have these modern braces here but nowadays they we use them in the west they are as good as any other immobilization technique but they are good that we can still mobilize the joints above and below though we are immobilizing the fracture internal fixation with plating, external fixation. There's an example of external fixation. Somebody uh, we've done for a subtrochanteric femur fracture. It's a 12 year old boy who also had the uh, femoral artery evolution as a bullet injury and the fracture, infected fracture of the proximal subtrochanteric area of the femur. And this is an external fixture which is not only allowing the child to stand up, to weight bear, to bend the knee, to move the hip. Very good. Restore the function. Again, same. During the fracture healing, while the fracture is healing, after the fracture is healed. If you can't move a limb, how will you exercise this? That's the way to exercise. Do isometric exercise. Don't move the limb, just contract the muscle. Uh, physiotherapists uh, normally teach them how to move the muscles, uh, contract the muscles without moving the limb. It's called isometric exercise. Mobilize the neighboring joints. Encourage weight bearing. This is one stimulus which is the best for bone healing. So as soon as they can be vertical, make them vertical. Elevation to avoid edema. Edema is not good for fracture healing. Whenever they can, put their feet up on two pillows while the fracture is healing. Balanced functional traction and splintage. Again, the one I showed you on the slide where the chap had a traction on his lying on the, on the bed. That's a balanced traction. That means the femur is being reduced, held, and still moving the knee joint. Physiotherapy and occupational therapy. We don't have occupational therapy very well established in our country, but physiotherapy is getting better. But occupational therapy, of course, gets you back to work. Whatever you do, maybe change your occupation. This is, these are the factors which probably maybe at your stage you need to consider. Somebody with a hand injury, you need to ask them to start thinking of something else which you can do, if they are a weaver or something. There's an external fixator holding the tibia, knee and ankle free, full weight bearing allowed. This is a take home message. I would like you to remember this circle. In any management, one of these uh, quadrants will be compromised. If you want to do something with the speed, the safety is going to be compromised. If you want to hold something very strongly, the movement is going to be compromised. So this is called a fracture quartet. Every time you manage, uh, do, you are doing a management of a fracture, if you have this in your mind, you will know which bit you can compromise and how much. Ideally, you should take them all along together. Do things with speed, still safety, hold it well and move it at the same time. But it is not, this world is not ideal, so something has to be compromised somehow. So the balance inside the circle needs to be struck by the surgeon. For example, this subtrochanteric fracture of the femur, we can treat it with the skeletal traction through the knee, put them on the bed. We are compromising 
movement. The knee won't move, the hip won't move. We are compromising safety. In a sense that the patient may develop a bed sore, may develop a DVT, may, we are compromising speed. It's going to take a long time to heal. So there are lots of compromises. But what we are saving, we are only saving the surgery. The safety, that the surgery is going to introduce infection, the plate is going to be put in, the anesthesia needs to be given. So we are only saving one aspect of it, compromising three others. That's where you need to strike a balance, how to manage a fracture. Remember the fracture quartet. I've got a list of fractures of necessity and I only have got five minutes remaining. So I'll quickly go through the list of fractures of necessity. These are the fractures, if you ever see them or if you have seen them, they definitely require uh, to be seen uh, by a referral center or somebody who's going to be doing a surgical intervention. Open fracture is going to need one. There's, there's no way out of it. Either the external fixation, you just cannot hold a fracture with a plaster which is open. A fracture dislocation, absolute indication. Supracondylar fracture in children can't be ignored. I've seen now three Walkman's ischemic contractures in children whose uh, supracondylar fracture was badly managed. As a result, the vascularity of the flexor compartment compromised and they have developed contractures in their hand. Very common. Epiphyseal injury, any injury which is near the growth plate or an intracapsular injury of the neck or femur or intraarticular fractures, again absolute indications. Unstable fractures which you can't hold the reduction or segmental fractures, double fractures in one bone, again absolute indication. More than one long bone, I have alluded to that earlier. Periprosthetic fractures, no way you can deal with them unless you operate on them. Periprosthetic means around a total hip replacement or around a knee replacement or around a nail, around a plate. Pathological fractures, again, an absolute indication, need to fix it. Examples now, quickly I go through them. This is an unstable fracture, you can't hold it in fracture, in a plaster. You put it in a plaster, two days later, swelling will go down, the fracture will re-displace. This fracture needs to be internally fixed. Of course, like that. Segmental fracture, double fracture, neck of humerus and then the shaft of humerus, difficult to hold. Difficult to hold in whatever way you try, you can't hold this fracture. It ends up having been fixed. More than one long bone fracture or a fracture near the growth end, uh, epiphyseal fracture. This has got a uh, salt harris 2 or the proximal epiphyseal fracture of the of uh, the radius. This, the head of the radius is left where it should be and this, uh, the fracture has gone through the epiphysis and the radius has gone up, the ulna is fractured. So there is a double fracture. Supracondylar fracture, you can't treat it conservatively. It's completely off, it's gone in the back. The brachial artery is here. You leave it very long, have uh, ischemia in the compartments. Absolute indication for open reduction and internal fixation. Now I use double wires and I do make two incisions, one on either side, to put these two wires. I want to make two because I want to look after the ulnar nerve while I'm doing it. Irreducible fractures. This is an irreducible fracture. Whatever way you manipulate it, still the ball is going to rotate around on the head of the humerus. It needs to be fixed internally. This is periprosthetic fracture. I mean, it's a fracture around a plate. There's a fracture, the plate was put in. You need to reinforce it with an intramedullary nail. To Pathological fracture. This is an osteoclastoma. This is my first patient here, actually. She's got an osteoclastoma, the proximal humerus, and a pathological fracture. It presented with pain after the fracture happened. So this uh, needs to be internally fixed. The cement is just filling the gap where the tumor was. Pathological fracture again following infection, fracture of the humerus, uh, femur, never joining up, big gap, it needs to be plated and grafted. Thank you very much. Bismillah. 